All right, so I want to, um, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to try to keep things quick. And most of all, I want you all to meet some of the amazing people we have in this group and use the next four days to get to know them during the breaks, during their sessions, uh, at the evening event or at the party tomorrow night. Um, these are really awesome people. They have lots of really valuable experience. And most of all, they can all help us think about the future of FOSS, which is why we're all here this week. Um, so I want to go in and just kind of go through person by person, um, get the photos up on the, on the screen here so you know who they, these people are and you seek them out over the next few days. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I work for the United Nations Foundation, uh, as mentioned. Uh, I work for an organization there called the Digital Impact Alliance and run a program called the Dial Open Source Center. Um, and our job is to support open source projects and free software projects that help make the world better by working on uh, humanitarian issues, international development, and peace building. Um, so we're all about trying to amplify the work that so many open source maintainers are already doing. And as I said, our esteemed panel, we have uh, Davide, who you just heard from, from UNESCO. Michael Ducey, raise your hand. Michael um, is... Sorry, my, my notes are out of whack here. Um, the Director in community, uh, of Community and Evangelism for CISTIG. Um, he is a great expert on how to leverage open source solutions and implement DevOps in organizations. Um, he's got a master's degree in computer science and an MBA. Uh, Jonas, Jonas, raise your hand. Uh, Jonas uh, works at Daimler and is responsible for blockchain and other distributed ledger technology there. Um, he's got a, also a diploma in computer science from the University of Bonn uh, and has studied metadata, data quality, and neural networks. A really awesome person. He also works on the Hyperledger project. So if you're interested in distributed ledgers, uh, talk to him this week. And then Marian. Here we go. Hello. Uh, he is the head system architect at an organization called SiteGround.com. Um, he's been working with Linux for almost 20 years, so that's quite a long time and has seen a lot of change over the years. A huge fan of FOSS and is a co-organizer of Bulgaria's largest FOSS conference called Open, Open Fest. Um, and in his spare time, as if he doesn't do enough, he also teaches Linux system administration to people as well as network security. And then Anjali, can you raise your hand? Anjali is a, is a student at the Bukit View Primary School right here in Singapore. Uh, she has her work showcased at Maker Faire in the past, uh, is working on a project uh, called Sciencer, which is really awesome, and it uses artificial intelligence for science education. Uh, she's got a ton of awards, too many to name. Uh, most recently at the National University of Singapore, they had a Hack and Roll Freshman Award, uh, has won second place in a few different uh, hackathons like Idea Shack and Code Extreme Apps. Uh, she has interned at Microsoft doing AI hacking, uh, and her skills include hardware development, public speaking, and programming. So let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, we have, uh, we've all gathered here to kind of talk about what the role of open source is. And I want to start with the past a little bit, and I'm going to ask everyone, uh, I'm going to ask a few key people each of these three questions. So we're going to talk about the past. Um, kind of the current and some of the current issues, then we're going to go into the future. Um, so I'll call you out by name and um, try to limit your responses to no more than two or three minutes each so we can kind of keep things moving and, and get out of here on time. Uh, so the first question I'm going to pitch to uh, both uh, Michael and Marion, maybe to start. Um, and for those of you who are here this morning, you heard some talk about over the past few months how there's been some noise uh, and, and coverage in the news about companies and, and different organizations. And looks like we need the yellow microphone. Good. Okay. So we've heard some news about uh, organizations and companies uh, really concerned that maybe this open source thing isn't great for uh, keeping their revenue coming, keeping money coming into the company over the long term. And they've been struggling with what they call sustainable business models. And there's been some gripes that the current open source licenses that are out there um, have actually uh, are broken, uh, according to some people. And we need to do some reinvention of what open source means for some of these companies. Um, so I want to ask the two of you and, and others if you, if you feel strongly about this, um, if you feel that, uh, that FOSS is indeed broken right now and needs some reinvention, or do we just need maybe some more creative thinking from other areas uh, about how to sustain financial resources uh, for organizations, uh, maybe new business models for people who use free and open source software to innovate technology.
technology? Um, and then finally, do you think that there's any value in having, uh, continuing to have these agreed standard definitions like what the open source initiative has uh, for the, the open source definition saying an open source license must be all of these different things? Do you think that's still valuable as we look toward the future or do we need to think differently about what open source means and how people can uh, create business opportunities with open source? Any thoughts? That was that was a lot. Uh, I might it's, need it's to open -ended. Have like repeat half of that. Um, so going to the kind of current issue of <clears throat> what we've seen with Redis and then recently with Elastic, uh, and then changing licensing models and trying to come up with licensing models that um, kind of protect their revenue. I think part of the problem is is the idea of creating a sustainable company has changed greatly. Uh, than what it used to be. You know, um, if you told someone if they were going to open a small business that was a 40, 50 million dollar uh, small business and that was your re yearly revenues, you would be an extremely successful small business owner, right? Or even medium sized business owner. And now that's no longer good enough. Uh, and that's mainly no longer good enough because um, as soon as you start taking venture capital, you're no longer. Um, beholden to your users, you're beholden to your investors. And that changes the relationship. And, and that's why you see companies that are going through these licensing changes to kind of protect their bottom line and protect, protect their revenue. Um, open source business models are hard and I, I don't feel like anyone's really gotten it right except Red Hat. Uh, and they did for a really, really long time of taking that support model. But, you know, should we forget, you know, what Red Hat went through uh, 12 years ago when they closed all their binaries off and made all the binaries be something that you had to purchase. And the open source communities found ways around it with projects such as Fedora and CentOS. Um, and now they've kind of pulled those, those projects back in, right, as being a core component. So um, I think we do need to relook at what those business models are. Um, I probably don't have a, an answer off the top of my head of one that works, but I also, I think we just maybe need to calm down and like not everyone needs to have a billion dollar acquisition uh, and can we just build sustainable companies that are sustainable companies and not the constant Silicon, Silicon Valley unicorn. I would add that uh, without open source licensing that we currently have, well, we wouldn't have the service companies that we currently have because every service company is uh, sitting on top of a lot of open source software and without that you wouldn't have uh, anything, you wouldn't have the cloud and it's not possible to actually go there without uh, all this software. No single company, whatever the size of it is, uh, cannot build all this tech and support all this tech without the open source community. Yeah, and I think the other thing I would add to that is, um, you know, let's not sit here and pretend that they're all altruistic and their motives behind why they're con starting to contribute to these open source projects. They've changed their business models to where they need to drive compute consumption, and that's how they make money, and therefore creating healthy projects that can drive compute consumption is where their business model is. Yeah, essentially. And I want to add for uh, the licensing and the standards, Without standards, we wouldn't have the internet. Internet started with different standards, and when internet became the standard, then inter internet was actually built and uh, started growing so, uh, in such pace that we see now. Without good standards that are one single standard agreed upon between different companies, we wouldn't be able to communicate easily. And Jonas, I think you had an idea. Too. Yeah, uh, I, I think we have to, to look at many of those of those areas. Yeah, first of all, uh, one the the, uh, the sentence from IETF is one of my favorite ones. We don't believe in uh, kings and queens and presidents. We only believe in running co rough consensus and running code. Yeah. Uh, so, and I think that's also how the standards of the futures are being made. Yeah. And um, you can see that if you look at uh, licensees, yeah, what kind of licensees are most used on GitHub, at least, yeah, that's MIT. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's good to have a standards organization that says, yeah, this is a, a free and open source software uh, license, yeah? uh, like the OC license. Yeah? 
uh, and that's uh, very important because um, if you are disputing, you always want to look somewhere where you have some standard. Yeah? Uh, furthermore, um, if, if you think about yeah, how do the open source world, uh, how does it change and are uh, like MongoDB and so on aggressive with, uh, with the licenses and stuff like this, yeah? let's not forget that uh, a lot of the, the business which is currently running yeah, has not been made real contact with the open source world. Yeah? So this is uh, maybe a lead problem here, but people discussing that and understanding that. Uh, I work for a, a company that has been um, transforming materials to cars yeah? and selling them, luxury cars, Mercedes. Um, and uh, nowadays, in the older times, the car was just, it, it was just hardware. Yeah? Nowadays it's hardware and software and um, you cannot build anything without uh, the right software on it. Yeah? Like, uh, so, and the question is, with Daimler and FOSS, yeah, so what are we doing with it? And I think there will be a lot of companies that go through the same process as we are currently, meaning opening up yeah, uh, to save yourselves. Yeah? Because um, uh, those Googles and everything, they, they were born in that space. Yeah? Microsoft made a quite nice transition to that, yeah, in some extent. Yeah. But a lot of businesses have they have no clue about software, yeah. and uh, so no clue about open uh, software, and that uh, is, uh, I think, a step which is are going to follow. Uh, and the question is, uh, what's your business model behind that? And the business model transforming something into something else will always be there. Yeah, it's a very abstract, but usually, I mean, just packaging water yeah, uh, is a business. Yeah. G going to Starbucks and getting a coffee, you can do it at home, it's a business. Yeah. So um, this kind of business will always be there, and the question is how do they transform also with soft software or to software? You, you're, you're reminding me of a challenge that uh, people in my world, which are a lot of nonprofits and government organizations, struggle with what can we learn from the other people who are a few steps ahead of us, who have tr tr struggled with some of these problems already? So what I'm hearing from all of you are a few th things that are key, I think, is A, we've still got to work together and collaborate with each other um, and, and learn from each other, but to do so in an, with a spirit of, of openness and, and authenticity um, and know that people may have other motives besides just collaboration. Um, and I'm reminded that there are some really good organizations out there that I think we need to invest our energy in, in supporting or creating more of them. Uh, there's an organization called the To Do Group, um, which is for companies that have uh, focus on open source technology, um, where those business people can learn from each other and, and share ideas. Um, as well as the open source initiative, I'm hearing several of you say that it's still important for there to be a community group that defines what does it mean for us to, to share our technology with each other, be those open source licenses or other things. So we should try to find those types of organizations, embrace them, join them if they have membership organizations, and be a part of them when we can. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I want to take us now to uh, the, the near-term future, I think is the best way to say it. Um, in your comments about automobiles um, reminds me that We've seen the lines between hardware and software get more blurry uh, in the last several years. Um, now we've got you know, open source software specifically in everything from cars to obviously our smartphones and our, our kitchen appliances now very commonly. Um, but more recently, in the, just in the last couple of years, we've started to hear people voice more and more concern about uh, how the data that these, these gadgets are collecting, how is that information used? And maybe it's, it's great to get something really useful out of it, uh, you know, t to begin with, but what happens when more and more of, of your data becomes stored in, in the cloud and, and with these organizations? Um, and so we've heard a lot of calls that something needs to be done about those risks. Um, and just in the, fast, in the past week, um, uh, we saw some tweets uh, about the Suzy AI smart speakers. Uh, I think we're going to be hearing about those over the next couple of days, um, where the FOSS Asia community has actually built software and hardware to kind of compete with this and, and offer an alternative model. So maybe I'll ask both Davide and, and Jonas at least to think about this um, and talk a little bit about how organizations that are building devices or services that just regular people use, 
Um, how can those organizations and people who are building those things, how can they earn the trust of the people using the technology um, and help them understand that their data will be used responsibly over the long term? And does open source software have a role to play in that trust? Um, uh, not only open source software, but maybe open data licenses and other issues. Uh, any thoughts, Jonas, since you have the mic to start with? Oh, oh yeah, sure, certainly. I mean, this, uh, this is a hard, uh, a, a big problem yeah, to solve, uh, and uh, it's necessary to solve it. I mean, in, in Europe, at least, we have now the GDPR, so the general data protection uh, laws. Uh, that make it, e let's say, it easier for people like me who are conscious about what kind of data they produce uh, to inquiry uh, to the companies uh, how the data is used there. Yeah? And you have the right to be forgotten and, and a lot of other things as well there. Yeah? So at least that is one part. Legislation is a very important part of how to, to deal with data. The consciousness of that you're producing data all day and that you're consuming data all day is very important. Yeah? And that is something which is, a, I don't think, a problem for anybody who's here, uh, but a problem for the general user often. Yeah? They're so, certainly surprised that, wow, this data is there. Wow, uh, unbelievable. Yeah? And then secondly, uh, or thirdly, you need this kind of data also for different kinds of business models. And it's, and it's not always bad to have this data. Yeah? but how can we use it? And I think you, you already made a point there. Uh, open source plays a very important role and maybe also open data access. And the, uh, in the GDPR, there is the, send, the, 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 the line that you have to make it exportable uh, to some format. Yeah? And that already helps um, if you know what kind of data do you have in there. And uh, the next question is, sure, we have to improve on that. Um, the, the open source also um, gives you benefits in terms of that because if you know how your data is processed, yeah, that can give you some trust. Yeah. Uh, but it still, uh, if you don't store the data right on the right place, it can be misused. Yeah? And if it's once out, yeah, it's away. So the topic we saw before uh, with the security uh, is also very important. So there are, are multiple steps that you have to be conscious, secure the data, and be open with it, um, but not allow to, to go it wild. Davide, I wonder if you can respond to that uh, with a different lens, and that is how technology is often used in the developing world or countries where um, they may have people coming in with technology from the outside, um, and how they perceive uh, the notion, if they do at all, uh, of this idea of owning their own data and, um, and what do people struggle with on both sides of that equation, but the people using the technology and the people building it, uh, what do they need to consider in terms of the people who are ultimately using the tech? Ooh, so, <laughs> easy question. Uh, easy question. <laughs> no, well, um, I think in general, of course, the uh, I mean, observation is that uh, uh, when technology is uh, exported, uh, particularly in, in developing countries, so that's uh, not badly perceived. I mean, uh, it's uh, rather perceived as an opportunity to uh, to, to jump for, biz for business, for for job uh, creation, uh, things like that. But uh, at the same time, you know, the process that uh, was uh, put in place in uh, Europe for the GDPR is was incredibly long and I think this is the only way that uh, you may really respond to uh, this kind of needs uh, and uh, it, it, uh, and it's very complicated because uh, it's a typically uh, the response of the policy which uh, happens when when uh, a bit later when things are already happened so I think there is a lot to learn also from, from uh, countries that uh, um, are not, uh, in, uh, they don't have this kind of policies to uh, learn that about this pro the process that has been going on. Because uh, then when uh, policy moves, it may uh, be uh, very, you know, um, like an elephant in the, in the room in the sense that, for example, we saw in switching to the open source, uh, we saw the, uh, the debate on the reform of the copyright, which was uh, you know, on, on the copyright for uh, authors like uh, you know, books uh, or uh, other things. And then uh, with, without uh, even thinking about that, this was uh, actually 
hitting very hard, uh, st still in Europe, uh, sorry, hitting very hard the uh, software world because uh, the wording that was used uh, denoted a complete uh, non-awareness about the software as uh, a part of the uh, creation process, as a part of the industry process, as a part of uh, the, el the element of the equation. And this is uh, what is uh, very, com very complicated. So I think uh, the response from uh, uh, organizations uh, and from also the community is really to push for awareness and raising. It's, uh, it's a long process, but uh, it's uh, only through this that you may uh, hope that uh, the policy process really takes time, uh, takes a place in, in a reasonable time and with, uh, without, without creating uh, you know, problems uh, more than solving them. Thank you. And Anjali, you've got the microphone. I'm wondering, uh, especially as a younger person, um, if you have any ideas about all of this information that we're, we're sharing through social media, everything else, um, do you have thoughts on, on what it means to trust others uh, with, with our data over time? Yes, I do. I don't use social media much, but I've heard of cases when there's data stealing on social media. And I think it'll be good if the social media plats can, platforms can be made open source so people can look into the back end and see the data. Apart from social media, there are cases with AI, for example. I've been working on a lot of AI projects. There's Science And there's this one called Mercury, which is a sign language translator. And for that, it needs to take images of the user, sometimes of your face. And with that, there's a problem for the user, because they want to see where their data is going, whether we are using it for something that's not really great. So I think Mercury is also open source now, but yeah. Good, so uh, quickly recapping that, I'm hearing again the, the call for working with each other to learn from what other people have experienced. Sometimes people are a few steps ahead, and we can, we can learn from that and adapt it. And again, for transparency, ultimately, um, uh, being so critical uh, and not even even if we don't take the take the incentive to go and look at the code um, you know it goes back to the old uh, Linus's law uh, uh, of, of many eyes make all bugs shallow right the more people who are able to see things the stronger uh, the stuff that we build can be over time so thank you I want to take the last question here both to Anjali and to Davide um, to think more about the future now um, but to talk about the future, I want to say just a, a quick word about the past. So if you look at the history of, of technology, as, as we think about it at the UN Foundation, there's kind of three phases when you start uh, using technology to solve a problem. The first phase is where you have someone from the outside kind of dropping something in front of you and saying, here, use this. Uh, we think this is going to be great for you. Uh, enjoy. <laughs> and then the second phase, uh, we, we move to this era where we had uh, what, what's often called user-centered design, where you design for specific use cases. You try to understand how people want to use the technology, um, and you try to, to bring them in and ask questions about how they're doing using that, that technology. Um, and then the third phase, which is more where we are now, is you actually build platforms for people to create their own solutions to problems. And this is now where we get into the age of, of social networking. Um, we, you have these platforms where people can do their own coding and deploy their own apps very easily, the GitHubs and the GitLabs of the world. So question for both of you. As we look into the future now, um, do you think it's more likely that people will f um, will stick with this kind of structured role where you have something like Facebook or Twitter and you have to, you have to create within their boundaries, or Instagram even, where you're welcome to create and, and express yourself to the world, but you do it within their rules, right? Or do you think what the, the, the future really holds are more in tools like, like GitLab or, or Glitch.com, if you know about that, um, or other types of online maker spaces where people can actually create their own solutions to problems. Um, do you think one will prevail over the other one will be more, more popular in the long term? And then do you think that open source has a role to play in either one of those, which other, whichever you think is more likely? So Anjali, we'll start with you. Oh, wow, that's a big <laughs> load of questions. So, um, well, your first point, the three stages where somebody drops a product in front of you, 
where the developer makes a user-centered product and where there's a platform for users to create their own product. The first stage, I think that's not exactly false products, so-called. That's usually something like PowerPoint. Somebody drops a product in front of your face and says, use this. But for false products, the main reason why people use them is because they're accessible. Developers put them up all over the pages, let us get as many outreach as possible, and people use it. And the third stage, um, there's a platform like that. It's where I started coding, and it's called Scratch. And it uses block-based programming language. And a lot of young kids start by using Scratch. And in Scratch, it follows the, you know, Apple has this analogy for music. It goes create, rip, mix, burn. I think you'd have heard about it. Yeah. So Scratch kind of follows this analogy. It allows users, kids like us, to create our own projects. It allows us to rip off code from other people's projects. In the big world, this would be called an API. Yeah, it allows us to rip off code and use it in our own project. It allows us to remix someone else's project. And it allows us to burn our projects or to publish it to the Scratch community. So would all these stages be put together? That's your question, three stages. Well, um, yes and no. The second two stages, these are false products. They'll definitely be put together. But the first stage, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe, maybe not. Thanks, Dalide. Any thoughts? I think uh, you know the. the um, it, uh, well, I, I think first of all, uh, let me start from the end of your question, because also we use Scratch a lot in all these uh, <laughs> exercises we do. Um, but the purpose is not to write software in a closed environment. I think this is something which uh, I, you know really personally try to fight with all means because uh, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to learn. And you know, there's an analogy, the famous, the famous analogies of uh, learning how to fish so that uh, you, know, you can, uh, you, you can uh, eat every day. So the thing is really this. So the, the working on a closed environment uh, should not be taught as a limitation because of course you may have learned to learn in a closed environment uh, because you want to learn on Scratch, you want to learn on other tools, etc., on Facebook apps. But at the end of the day, if you learn the right way, then you're free because uh, actually you learn the process. You learn that you can do it. And uh, this is what programming should be. And this is where uh, you know, I was talking about uh, being creative and being... So I think we should look at... Uh, uh, positively, of course, so there are many negative signs as well because, of course, the industry is may, maybe pushing towards these uh, streams of closed uh, uh, environments because you know, that's, that's what the, the business. That's normal. But uh, at the same time, we should uh, try to pu continue to push uh, the other way around. And the community of developers is is, is big, is growing. There, really, there are many developers uh, all the world, and uh, so I mean, uh, things we cannot be just streamline. I don't believe that it will happen like this. I think at some point some other group will emerge with a new thing and uh, things will not be confined in that. So, and I think, you know, what, uh, she, she's completely right. She, I think she, she knows it already. Can I pinch in here? Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the biggest users of uh, software is governments. And what I see is that uh, governments will change and uh, Every software that they commission should become open source. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Bulgaria is the only com uh, country in the world that has a law that says every software that is written with public money should be open source software. Yeah. And uh, this uh, may be holding the future of open source because now as uh, programmers, we would not only uh, program for ourselves, for our first projects, but we could actually uh, influence how our governments work or how the work is actually done inside our governments. So FOSS in this way can benefit everyone. If your money, your taxpayer money are going to uh, private companies that are building FOSS projects, we would get even better FOSS projects. 
Yeah, agreed. And and uh, for those of you either watching online or, or uh, have a laptop, go to publiccode.eu. The Free Software Foundation in Europe has a great campaign about this very topic and tells you why that's so important. So we're almost out of time, and I wish I could stay here all night with all of you because you're so awesome and, and inspiring. Um, but what we're going to do um, to kind of advertise what your interests are, and, and we, we have three more days of the conference after today, um, but I'm going to go around just straight down the line, and I want to ask you all the same question, and, and, and here's the deal. Uh, the people out in the audience here and the people watching at home uh, on, on YouTube uh, are super smart. They are the people who are going to be building the future, right? Uh, for many of us, you know, we're, we're kind of coasting down, but we have a lot of young people here. Um, and so I guess the question for each of you um, is what one piece of advice would you give the people uh, watching, watching us discuss here? Or, or would you ask them maybe a question uh, to kind of... Uh, spark some innovation in their minds um, to result uh, ultimately in the future that we all want to see. I think we all have a vision of the future we'd like, and we all have an idea of how, uh, how FOSS can be involved in that. So uh, pose a question or, or offer some advice to the people out there um, in one, one or two sentences maximum. Davide? You should win the prize for the incredible quest most incredible questions. Um, well, advice I think I already spoke about that. My advice is really believe, believe in it and uh, use op openness uh, the right way and then there will be no, but the future will be better. Uh, the question is, uh, are you ready to make it? So basically, uh, what are you going to make it as an individual to participate in the community? So that's a bit my, my question. Um. I would say that uh, at most FOSS conferences that I visit, uh, I speak with a lot of people that have their own own projects, home projects for the car or something, but they don't share these projects. So push those projects, add a license that you like, an open source license, and push them, share it, and share these projects with uh, everyone. And uh, this way, anyone else that is working on a project similar like yours, uh, can cooperate with you, or you could actually help them, their project, to start working, actually. Um, you know, we talk a lot, at least in the U.S. tech community, uh, in Europe to an extent as well. I'm not sure too much in Asia. But we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion and other ideas like that. Um, and I think um, the next generation is getting exposed to it and a much different conversation than I did. Uh, but I think one of the power, more powerful things that I think about, like my journey through open source, is that when you're interacting with somebody online and on a mailing list, you like you have no idea about their socioeconomic status, the color of their skin, where they're from, what languages they speak. Well, maybe, but all of those things kind of get erased, and we're just two people having a conversation about trying to solve a software problem, and. Uh, I like that idea, and I think as the next generation comes up, these problems are going to get better, but we always need to be remembered of like when it comes down to technology, we're all just same humans trying to save the, solve the same problems and uh, keeping that in mind to work together and make the world a more welcoming place is the advice I would give. So maybe my advice, but that's just my personal thinking, yeah? it's, um uh, what I would really like to see is education, uh, more education. Yeah? And I mean that in both ways, meaning that not only teach kids uh, how to, to code and, and use Scratch and be then a programmer or, or advance in open source, but also teach uh, society something about that topic yeah? uh, from below to the up. Yeah? Because I have uh, several concerns with also legislation currently running in Europe. Uh, or uh, society status, uh, for the one thing, I, I like your analogy, um, uh, but in the end technology might be one of the problems over in there, yeah? and I have, uh, let's say, how can we retain the FOSS and the freedom, yeah? not free as free beer, but the freedom, how can we retain the freedom, yeah? because in several countries uh, those kind of um, 
people, how they rule, uh, at least to my personal belief, are concerning. And so I would like to see more of those Gretas and so on on other countries to, to step in for something that they like. And once you have hit uh, the, the world of working, then it might get difficult because you're so indulged in the other topics. And so I would, that's my advice or my wish. Since I'm kind of the future, this advice applies to me as well, <laughs> not just you. So it goes like this, follow the ABC. Aspire to dream, dream big, dream until your head bursts and all your thoughts flow out of your head. B stands for be curious, sorry, I got the wrong one. Be brave, <laughs> go off, try every single idea, don't hesitate at all. And C stands for be curious, just think every day when you come home, ask yourself, what have I learned today? What did I learn new? And why is this like this? Can it change? Can I change it? Great. Thank, thank you all. And, and Anjali, uh, you just reminded me of a quote that we like to talk about uh, uh, at, at my office at the UN Foundation. Um, there's a person uh, from World War II named Anne Frank uh, from the Netherlands. And one of the things that she wrote in, in her famous diary was uh, how wonderful it is to know that nobody need wait a single moment to make the world a better place. And it's, it's all about getting up and going out there. Uh, we've built a lot of the tools that can start to make that happen, but we need to stand together. And what we've heard through all of these comments is we're stronger when we work together. Um, so find people who, who align with your values and your vision about the future and go for it. So thank you all for your, your comments today. I don't know, do we have uh, any time for questions? Or are we at, the, at a cutoff time? Okay, so two questions. Anyone from the audience? Do we have a, okay. So I guess just stand up and, and be loud and I'll repeat the question. Yeah, we're really short on time. I guess maybe, maybe I'll, I'll say this, um, and for those of you on the video, Davide, can you speak a little bit more about the, um, where we see the gender gap um, between maybe the education system um, and then the actual the industry or the people actually doing uh, technology work? Yes, no, true. Uh, unfortunately, the presentation was a bit too quick. Uh, so, uh, I mean, of course, uh, yeah, there, there is a gender gap. This is uh, unfortunately, uh, in general, worldwide true. Now, there are countries where there is the, some, some, sometimes the proportions are reversed, but this is uh, not uh, in many places, uh, unfortunately. Now, the, for the fact that, uh, uh, of course, uh, people make choices uh, for you no know, studies or things or or for the future, that's uh, true, but uh, this is also true that uh, there is uh, a society around uh, which is uh, uh, consciously or not consciously pushing towards people, towards a certain kind of, uh, of uh, directions. So we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, biases, let's say, or in, uh, in, um, in, in people's lives from, from very young age. Uh, that uh, may apply, uh, may influence uh, choices later on. So in general, unfortunately, and there are not many data actually on the, f on, on the software, on so software development, uh, it's really low. It's uh, something like 20% of women in the, uh, in the, let's say worldwide. Uh, 
uh, in this in this the latest data which are very available for uh, the free and open source but this was a few years ago was as low as uh, two or three percent now this was maybe a few years ago maybe now now it's certainly improved i guess i hope but uh, it mean uh, there is uh, in many places uh, uh, a, a blatant uh, gender gap in the com software communities, maybe not uh, here in, the, in this country. Um, and also the fact that uh, uh, one of the remedy which is uh, taken is uh, many times to do things only for girls. So there are many projects that also we do, and uh, which is not probably the best approach is to is to develop projects uh, that are uh, exactly bringing uh, more girls into the computer science, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, job, or, or um, and, uh, and and this is maybe uh, a solution in some places because uh, actually, uh, otherwise the girls would not do it if uh, if uh, men would be uh, let's say part of it. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's uh, maybe uh, not really closing the gap because you are creating more divide in the sense that uh, you, what, uh, what would be best is to have a full inclusion and the people work together, uh, all of us. So um, I, don't, I don't think that I can be very exhaustive. Uh, uh, we can talk later about this. But um, uh, certainly, yes, there is a gender gap. Uh, second, the choice is not... Uh, and it's, it's certainly we cannot really say that the choices are really autonomous because uh, we are guided into discovering things through our, our lives. And in some places, there are more opportunities than others. And then, uh, um, voila. So when, when uh, there is a counseling, of teachers like you are very important uh, in, in uh, pushing people towards making some choices. Uh, and so I'm happy to hear that uh, in this in this case, case this is not uh, a problem. Uh, I'm helping organizing uh, Rails Girls events in Bulgaria, and what I hear from the girls is that the IT environment is a hostile environment for girls. It's like uh, you are making a minor from a girl, uh, very intensive, uh, heavy, uh, heavy. Uh, job that uh, is primary uh, m men are working there in IT you have the same thing even though it's not so, so heavy as a job but the community actually the men inside the IT are pushing out the girls they are not including them this is uh, a big issue because yeah she may have finished a PhD in computer science they still won't believe that uh, this code would work. And this is something that uh, we don't need to teach only the women. We actually have to teach the men that this code works no matter what's the gender of the person. If it works, it works. You don't care what, who wrote it, what wrote it. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. I just yeah. add one thing. Uh, even if you're in a, you look at an industry and you see a, a perfect 50-50 split uh, between male and female, and um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're equal jobs and that they're paid the same. Uh, so there can still be a gender gap, even if you have a perfect 50-50 split uh, between male and female. The women are still paid 75 cents on the dollar compared to men. and in yeah. lots of cases. Yeah, I, I, would, just, I would just close with, uh, with another quote uh, that we like to use, and that's, nobody has the right to sit down and feel hopeless because there's too much work to do. Uh, not only technical problems, but human problems as well. Um, and so we, we all have a lot to do. So, so the young people among us don't have to suffer, uh, you know, just, just bad treatment. You know, everybody, we're, we're all peers, we're all smart, and we need every single brain that we can muster to build the future that we want to see um, for each other. So again, thank you all. Um, please uh, talk, talk to all these people over the next few days and give them a round of applause.